Tim and I like to discuss how books of the Bible are designed, their literary structure. And we also like to talk about themes in the Bible, motifs that go through the entire narrative arc of Scripture and tie the whole thing together. But in this episode, we're going to take a step back, and we're going to talk about what the Bible is in the first place. The Hebrew Bible is an extremely sophisticated piece of ancient literary art that has a theological message, but it's doing it through this incredibly nuanced literary medium. The Bible didn't drop out of heaven. It was produced over hundreds of years by many different authors who all came from one particular people group known as ancient Israel. It came into existence through the history of how God was at work with a people. It emerged out of that history. Through this people, God's working in human history in a unique way. You're trying to understand the story of the biblical texts and the message that they have. They, they're telling a story that has the people of Israel at its center, but it actually has the story of the whole world and all humanity as its main focus. In this episode, we talk about this collection of ancient texts that we call the Bible and why Christians have been intimately tied to this book. Here we go. So we are going to uh, produce a series starting in 2017 mm-hmm. um, about what is the Bible and how to read it. Mm. It's a very... 101. Very 101. We've been taking people through books of the Bible, themes that run throughout the whole Bible, but it kind of dawned on me, us, over, I don't know, recent past, that we don't have anything in the video library that takes someone who has virtually zero or zero knowledge about the Bible yeah. and helps them get going. Yeah, all our videos assume you understand some basic things about the Bible mm-hmm. and you're ready to jump in. I mean, you could just start in the Genesis videos and dive in, but that doesn't help you know why Genesis is in the Bible and how it fits into this thing called the Old Testament. We just don't have a lot like that. Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk through, specifically yeah. uh, what's the Bible, how it's composed, and not so much, we won't talk about how we got the Bible. Yeah. That'll be a whole nother conversation. Oh yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> that we'll we really, lucky. that we plan on having in uh, the future. Yes. Things we want to work on is a lot of the historical origins and where these collections that are called canons came from. And So we won't have that conversation, yeah. but we will talk about what the Bible is mm-hmm. and its what structure and... Yeah, and the different forms that the Bible takes in different religious communities today because there's more than one shaped to the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a controversial controversial topic. Um, So yeah, so uh, the way this is going to kind of flow is we just want to do a basic outline of what is the Bible and where did it come from in its basic shape. Uh, And then also, yeah, why did it take shape in different forms in different traditions in Christianity and Judaism? And by different forms, you mean there's the Jewish Bible. Jewish Bible that Christians would call the Old Testament Mm -hmm. um, or the Hebrew Bible. And then there's uh, the Protestant. Yeah, New the Testament. Protestant Bible would just would tack on um, the New Testament mm-hmm. um, as a collection of 27 books. Um, but then also in the mix is a number of Jewish writings that were written in the period of the Jewish Second Temple in between. After the Old Testament ends? After the Old Testament history period, uh-huh. not necessarily the formation of the book, okay. but the history period, but, and before Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah. Um, and these, the intertestamental period. Yeah, sometimes called the intertestamental period. I, I think it's more helpful to call it the, the, period, the second temple period, okay. how it's referred to. Why is that more helpful? Because... Uh, well, it gives us clear d- demarcations. Like nobody was marking history by when did the Old Testament end? <laughs> That's the end of an era. When did the New Testament begin? Like they were just in the thick of historical events, the swirl of the events. And, uh, but arguably, uh, New Testament writings are also Second Temple Jewish they literature. They are Second Temple literature. That's exactly right. So but is it helpful <laughs> to oh, call them both Second Temple? I think temple? so, yeah. There is a huge amount of literature produced by the Israelite people mm-hmm. in uh, the period of the Second Temple. Mm-hmm. And um, some of that literature got shaped into what became the Hebrew Bible. Mm-hmm. Others of that literature were important, but weren't included within the original shape of the Hebrew Bible, but were read and mm-hmm. valued by Jewish communities. And that's in- the stuff. Including the followers of Jesus. And and many of those books are the books that yeah. are found in the Catholic yeah, canonization so the Catholic of the Bible. Yeah, uh, the Catholic tradition 
um, and even preceding, there were discussions about these books as some kind of a collection alongside scripture, um, but uh, they were affirmed as scripture within the Catholic tradition. And so that's it's, uh, seven separate books and then two updated versions of Old Testament books. And that's the Catholic, the Catholic Bible. Um, within the Orthodox tradition, Greek Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox, mm-hmm. there's even a couple other books in their collection. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Which books are those? Um, they Enoch. Have? Oh, they have Enoch. Significantly, yeah, the book of oh, Enoch. Okay. Yeah. And so, all that to say is the Bible, well, this is important just to say from the beginning, and it's something important to us, the Bible Project is addressing a cultural perception that to believe that the Bible is a divine word um, means that human history and human involvement in the Bible was incidental or not significant um, because that would mar the fact that it's a divine word, which essentially needs to have fallen from heaven. Right. And that's an assumption that I think is actually not true to what the Bible says about its own origins, Hmm. because there's lots of information in the Bible about its own origins. But also, we lose something really important about what the Bible is, that it came into existence through the history of how God was at work with a people Hmm. through history. It emerged out of that history. And so we should expect the Bible's story to be somewhat complex, because God's chosen to get involved in the mess of human history. So the Bible has different shapes in different religious communities. Okay. And that's just a historical fact that's got to be recognized. And the quick cheat sheet is Jewish community is what the Christians call the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. There is mm-hmm. in the Catholic tradition, mm-hmm. what is it, four uh, intertestamental books? But uh, that seven you, books seven and books. two updated editions. Seven books. Seven wow. distinct books. Yep. Seven more books. Mm-hmm. Those were written during the Second Temple period. Mm-hmm. Um that Jewish people uh, didn't consider part of their canon, but considered uh, significant um, religious writings. Yeah, well, uh, um, in the same way that in cr- world Christianity today, uh, there is a difference of opinion about the shape of the Bible, okay. Protestant Bible, Catholic Bible, right. Orthodox Bible. That same kind of diversity existed uh, even in the Second Temple period about... When they were canonizing their scriptures. The, sh- the shape of the, the Hebrew scriptures. Okay. Yep. So yeah. some some relig- Jewish mm-hmm. uh, groups would say that was their scripture, part of the Some would canon. say only the five books of the Torah. Okay. We know of groups that said that. We yeah. know of groups that accepted what's called the three-part shape of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, there were other groups. Um, we... One of their libraries was discovered in, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm. and they seem to have viewed uh, some of their own writings within the community as having mm. s- some kind of authoritative divine status as well. So throughout history, there's <laughs> been diverse religious groups that have uh, believed the divine scriptures to have a different shape. So that's going to throw a wrench in it's some, mess pe- with some people, some people. and uh, that's okay. It's through a huge wrench in my view of things. Okay, so yeah, so Jewish, uh, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, so we've got the old. Sheet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this simple. I without, know you are, and I keep with, making a complex. No, that's fine, that's great. Yeah. So we got the, the um, Jewish scriptures, mm-hmm. yep. which, we, mm-hmm. which we call the Old Testament, but for them it's called the Tanakh, but yeah. during the Second Temple period, yes, that's right. there wasn't a, a unanimous yes. decision yeah, this is um, this is a surprise when I first learned it. Surprise many people, but um, the form of Judaism, modern Judaism as it exists today, in all of its different branches—Reform, Orthodox, and so on—but um, that all of that comes out of one crucially important stream of Jewish history in the Second Temple period. But it um, it it's not the only form that Judaism took in that period. It's just the one that became the most dominant throughout history. And the rest ended up mm-hmm. going Called away? Called uh, rabbinic Judaism. Okay. Is um, the shape. Uh, and it's the Judaism that's sh- informed not only by the scriptures, but also by two other bodies of religious literature after the scriptures that help them understand the scriptures. Yeah, what are those called again? The, uh, the, the Mishnah, the Mishnah and, the, and the Talmud. The Talmud, yeah, okay. In a way, an easy parallel is to think within Jewish history, uh, the Hebrew scriptures were supplemented by another body of literature, mm-hmm. the Mishnah and the Talmud, um, that all help uh, the people of Israel observe the laws of the Torah with great faithfulness. And that, and that, um, all one was that all um, 
Mm-hmm. This is all out, post. Uh, this that's generating the the ideas and the conversations and the traditions behind the mission of the Talmud are taking place uh, in the period around Jesus and afterwards. Okay. Um, so what happened to all the other Jewish traditions? Um, they were a part of historical groups that uh, just went out of existence. Yeah. Um, some still exist. Like, um, I mean, there's a debate. There's a group called the Samaritans who claim a connection to the okay. early history of Israel. Yeah. They still exist. Mm. It's a very small population. It's a small ethnic population um, that's existing and carrying on on the basis of the five books of the Torah. There were, yeah, other groups um, I mean, they're mentioned in the New Testament sometimes, Sadducees. Uh, The Pharisees are the nucleus of the group that would become what's called the shapers of rabbinic Judaism. Oh, really? And this, okay, we're Mm -hmm. totally rabbit trailing here, but that's great by me. (laughs) So what's the Sadducees, how do they differ from the Pharisees? Uh, Sadducees were the power brokers in Jerusalem uh, who were in charge of the city and the temple complex. So they weren't like rabbis. Um, I mean, there were religious Torah scholars, you know, on payroll, (laughs) Um, but for the most part, they were, uh, yeah, a small group of elite and powerful uh, families running the show in Jerusalem. Uh, The Pharisees were a lot more like a popular religious political movement um, that didn't have a base of power in Jerusalem, Mm. but they had... Uh, centers of influence all over the land of Israel. Mm. And they were rising to their peak of influence in the period of Jesus Mm. and the apostles, which is why they appear so much in the New Testament. And you're saying that's the seedbed for the rabbinic tradition. Exactly right. Um, As far as we can tell, yeah, the Pharisees are the nucleus. They had a vision for what the Jewish people needed to become. And after the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, it was these leaders who forged a new path for existence. Because uh, Israel existed as a temple Jerusalem focus yeah, religion. And, and then there's no more temple. And then there's no more temple and Jerusalem's destroyed. And so the Pharisees were, yeah, the seedbed of what would become Judaism as it exists throughout its history. Um, and so this all takes place post-New Testament period. And so um, the, the interpretations of life according to the Torah that the Pharisees were developing Kept, kept developing and later became these two bodies of literature called the Mishnah and the Talmud. I see. So they saw the Tanakh as the canonization of scripture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They treat it as whole, you know, a divine human word. I mean, it's fat. And there's even more writings that, that these Jewish scholars produced in these centuries. But what's interesting to me, it's a parallel to the Jesus movement and then the writings that Jesus' followers produced that we call the New Testament. Mm. It's the Hebrew Bible in and of itself is an incomplete storyline. Right. It demands some form of completion. completion. Yeah. And so rabbinic Judaism and what's become kind of the dominant form of world Judaism today is one way. That was one way of a community completing. And so they supplemented it with other literature and they are living out their vision of what they think the scriptures call God's people to. But the Jesus movement was claiming the exact same thing, Mm -hmm. that the story of the scriptures was being fulfilled in Jesus and the movement he started. The Dead Sea Scroll community um, that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls down at Qumran, Qumran, yeah, which is the name of the location today where they were, they believed that the story of the Hebrew scriptures was coming to be fulfilled in themselves and their community and their leader, who they called the teacher of righteousness. So, So again, this is a good example where the Bible took a different shape in each of these communities because it emerged out of their history. Yeah. And so to understand what the Bible is automatically kind of tease you up to at least knowing something about the history of the people group at the center of the Bible, which is the history of the Israelite people. So we said we weren't going to talk about how the Bible was formed. I know. And I I feel like we're jumping into it. (laughs) But it is helpful. Okay, so Jewish scriptures. Yes. We call the Old Testament. Yeah. It's the Tanakh. Yep. In rabbinic Judaism today. Yeah. Rabbinic. Rabbinic Judaism, most main branches of Judaism today. Also have yep. the Mishnah and the Talmud, which mm-hmm. supplement. Yeah. The, and they, but do they, they don't put it at the same level. Uh, it depends on the, and the tra- way. Th- it depends on the tradition. Okay. It depends on the tradition. Yeah. So there are So some of their of, traditions will call it uh, at the same level of scripture in the same way that Christians mm-hmm. will consider mm-hmm. the New Testament. That's right. At the same level of yeah, scripture. Yeah. And there are traditions within Judaism that actually treat these later texts, Mishnah and Talmud, as actually in day-to-day use, more important 
than the Hebrew scriptures. Okay. Just like there are some forms of Christianity that treat the New Testament as more important. They'll acknowledge the Old Testament as scripture, but yeah. they never read it. Right. <laughs> they just read the New Testament. Got it. And there's a parallel to that within oh, okay. some Jewish groups as well. Yeah, it's probably because it's more applicable to... It's more applicable to their, their place in the story. Yeah. And, yeah, that's yeah, that right. makes sense. Okay, and then uh, Catholicism... It's tricky. So the Catholic Bible results from this body of literature that's pre-Christian. The Catholic Bible is a yes. body of literature the, that's pre-Christian. We're calling the apocryphal oh, yeah. or deuterocanonical works. Right. Jewish scripture right. before this Jesus. Is Jewish literature. Or, no, no, yeah. Jewish pre, literature Yeah, Jewish literature Jesus. that's pre-Christian. Yeah. That By pre-Christian, you mean before Jesus' death Before Jesus. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So um, these, these texts, I mean, they're brilliant. They're incredible works. And... Mm. You should know about them and read them. They're mm -hmm. amazing. But as, as far as we can tell from our ancient evidence, and I, I actually happen to hold a, a view about the shape and history of the Hebrew Bible and the canon um, that's not the majority view within the scholarly field. It's not a fringe view, <laughs> the view that I hold, but it's not the majority view, um, which is that the shape of the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, that Protestants know as the Old Testament, that that's uh, the original, most early shape of the Hebrew Bible. And okay. that that was, the boundaries of that were roughly firmed up within, somewhere within the 3rd to 2nd century BC. And that that's precisely the time period when these other works that are called the apocryphal or deuterocanonical works, that's when these works are being produced. Okay. And most of these works are aware of themselves as being dependent on the Hebrew scriptures in some way. Dependent, meaning uh, they quote from it, they're aware of it. Um, well, Scripture does that to itself all the time. Totally, yeah. I'm not saying it's a reason why it should or should Got be it. part of the Bible. It's just they they clearly come late in the literature of the bi biblical tradition. Um, and I think there are a number of internal clues within the Hebrew Bible and about these books that show they aren't designed to be part of the Hebrew Bible. They're just awesome literature that existed in Jewish communities alongside the Bible. And in the Catholic tradition and it, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition? But in the Catholic tradition, and well, in the early church, these books were read and preserved Got it. In, among Jesus' yeah. followers. Yeah. I mean, they're the reason why they actually were passed on and existed is because early, early Christians were reading them widely. Hmm. Um, but so, there was so whether a, or not they, they called them, considered them part of Scripture, they were... Uh, revered they've and they always been along. read and valued by Christians yeah. um, until the Protestant Reformation <laughs> oh, and, really? uh, and then only Catholic and Orthodox people have tended to read and value these writings which oh, okay. is really unfortunate hmm. um, but yeah so there was debate going on even in the first few centuries um, about the status of these books. Are they considered divine human word the same way as the Hebrew scriptures hmm. and there's a lot of debate going on about that okay um, and that gets us more to the details that are really fascinating, but I, I don't... But we won't get into. Dude, this video's going to have nothing to do with, <laughs> with the formation the, of the Bible. Yeah, this, this video really, the, the beginning of the How to Read the Bible series, it's just going to be like, what is the Bible? Yeah. It's the Old Testament. It's the New Testament. That's but the, it kind of helps... Protestant Bible. It helps I know, to understand um, how they came to be to understand why there's differences. I agree. But we don't have to get into it. I agree. So that we're going to have to find a balance. Let me, try to, let me try to do this summary one more time. Okay, we'll get through do. it. I've interrupted. You four no, times I keep, no, I just keep <laughs> rabbit trailing. So there's the Jewish scriptures called the Tanakh. We call it the Old Testament by we Protestant Christians. <laughs> <laughs> you and I. You and I. Yeah. <laughs> um, called the Old Testament. There was Jewish Second Temple writings that w that came on the heels of that, mm -hmm. which some Jewish mm -hmm. uh, traditions considered scriptures, some didn't, mm -hmm. um, called the intertestamental, no, the uh, apocryphal or... Mm -hmm. um, apocryphal is how Protestants refer to them. Deuterocanonical is how Catholics and Orthodox Deutero, refer to them. Deuterocanonical. Yeah, which just means a second canon. A second canon. Second part of the canon, yep. And um, Jesus, Jesus followers read these, uh, early Christians read these, and then there was all the material produced by uh, Jesus' apostles, mm -hmm. and yeah. that is then... The, the New Takes Testament the shape books, of the New Testament. Which, which Protestants consider part of the canon, and so do Catholics, and so do the Eastern Orthodox. Correct. Yep. That leaves just one more wrinkle, which is the Eastern Orthodox mm. has a couple more deutero-canonical yes. books than the Catholic tradition. That's correct. Okay. Yep. This will make much more sense when we visualize it. Yeah, yeah, it video. will. Yeah.
So the Bible is a book, and I just want to talk about this idea of a book really quick. Mm. Yeah. Um, so when I think of a book, I have different categories. Mm. Um, I think of a novel, so mm. a story with characters and a plot. And uh, I pick it up, chapter one, I start mm. reading, I learn about the world this story takes place in, and mm. there's conflict and resolution, and by the end, the book is done. Mm. That's So that's fiction. And then there's a nonfiction book, which is mm. uh, a lot of, it seems like a lot of nonfiction books I read are kind of like how-to books, mm-hmm. um, how, to, how to get better at things or how to think about things differently. Mm. Um, and those are like more topical, like here's a topic you know, creating a business and here's a, here's a book to, with a new idea for how businesses succeed or something. Mm. But then I'm also familiar with like textbooks, you know, going to school mm-hmm. and those are more like, let's try to really systematize all the information you need to know and bring it through, bring you through it in a very clear structure mm-hmm. and make sure you understand it and give you questions and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> those are kind of the main books, I guess. But then I'm like, but I read yeah. all sorts of other things. I read magazine articles. Yes. I read blog posts. Yeah. I read yeah. Facebook updates. Yeah. In fact, it's kind of been said that we're writing and reading more than any time in human history. Ah. So like we're very familiar with reading things. Yes. Whether or not it's an actual book. Mm-hmm. And so the Bible is a book. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't really fit any of those categories exactly. Well, we could add a few more categories. Okay. Um, and it may be just the categories that you don't read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but Scholarly so, stuff. <laughs> well, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking um, books can take a narrative format. There's narrative. But um, they can take the form of fictional narrative. Mm-hmm. But then there's, you know, historical narrative okay. that can be recreating... Uh, a fictional narrative within what we would take to be a historical event that took place in history. So, so everything in the, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, my kids are, my kids love. Uh, the Magic Treehouse. Magic Treehouse yeah. series. So it's all based, it's all a real Got time it. in history with real people. But fake stories. Oh, dude, I remember my five-year-old when it hit him. These didn't actually happen? Yes. He was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> that there was no actual yeah, magic but then, tree house. But then I had to try and explain to him, but, you know, Pompeii was real. That was a real <laughs> city. That was a, you know, real volcano that, you know, this kind of thing. And and then his brain was spun. He was like, wait, it's, so it's a real events with the other people Jack and Annie meet. Are Jack real, and Annie but are Jack real. and Annie are not real. And I think he gets it now. But that's complicated. But that's another form sure. of narrative. Yeah. Then there's straight historical up, fiction. Then there's straight up historical historical narrative, biography. Mm-hmm. That's narrative in its form. Right. Okay. But that's reconstructing historical events, mm-hmm. but creating a plot line and showing you the thread between events. So those are all forms of narrative writing, and uh, they can all be different levels of quality too. And there's historical nonfiction, which is. Let's try to. It's kind of like a biography, but about oh, yeah. a time of. Pl- That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a. Yeah. L- less interesting, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Probably less interesting. <laughs> Just reading summaries of historical events. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so obviously the Bible is dominantly uh, narrative, precisely 43%. <laughs> Some <laughs> nice little st- graph here. Statistics in front of me and a nice chart. So, narrative, it's the most dominant shape that the Bible takes. Um, narrative meaning there's characters. In a setting. Yeah, characters a in plot. a setting with a plot line driving the storyline forward. Yeah. And that's from page one, in the beginning. <laughs> so the, so there's a narrative unifying the entire, this entire collection from beginning to end. Mm. Within that narrative are large sections or some books that are entirely poetry, mm-hmm. either poetry embedded in narrative or um, whole books of poetry. And then there's also a, a broader category that you could just call discourse, which it's not storytelling, mm. it's not poetry, it's just speech. Yeah. Um, so the, in the Old Testament, the classic example is the book of Deuteronomy, which is Moses' speech to mm. Israel. In the New Testament, this would be something like the letters, Paul's letters. Yeah. But it's tricky because even Paul's letters sometimes... Have poems in them. Have poems in them, many. And sometimes he's in narrative mode. Mm. Tell, telling about... Telling a story about what happened to him or telling in short form the story of Jesus. Okay. 
So, Which, I mean, we're familiar with. Someone can give a speech yeah. and be telling a story within their speech. Yeah, that's right. So using narrative. Yeah. So uh, one way to put it is that the Bible is a totally unique kind of book on the modern literary scene. Yeah, there, like, there isn't a good uh, <laughs> It's not a good equivalent. analogy, perfect analogy. Because, um, because you could pick it up and it's a book. It's a book. But then... And you realize it's a small library But it's a books. small library of books. But it's not like walking into a li- the library, which is different books and different authors that have no cohesion. Right. They um, all work together. Yeah. So in the Bible, we're talking about the first collection, the Old Testament, that has over a thousand year long formation history, a millennium long formation history. 4,000, you said? 1,000. 1,000. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm, 1,000. Yeah. Um, and the New Testament, in terms of the events, that's and that thousand years is from the events, roughly, uh, that we can date historically, and then to the around 300, 200 BC. A thousand years, that's a long time. It's a long, it's a long period of formation. Um, for the New Testament, it's, it's shorter, because it begins with the events surrounding Jesus of Nazareth, and then it goes through to the events of his followers over the next uh, 60 some odd years. Uh, so the formation history of the books of the New Testament is like 60 years. Mm. A thousand. So these are two very different collections with very different formation histories. They cohesively read together as one unified epic narrative. Yeah. So yeah, let's think you're good at analogy. So what's an analogy <laughs> for... Well, I was just trying to think of some like um, mm. uh, fictional... Yeah. Like let's just make a fictional book. Well, like... uh, I mean a close equivalent that I think the author was trying to imitate biblical style is something like the Lord of the Rings epic. Huh. So it's fictional, but um, you know, Tolkien was a, a he structures it in terms of books mm-hmm. that don't actually match the physical books. If you mm-hmm. get the trilogy, it's three books, mm-hmm. but it's actually I think it's six or seven books uh, within those three right. physical books. Okay. And it feels like you're reading a section from this ancient document, <laughs> and then there'll be a poem embedded mm. by some characters, mm. and then an epic narrative about here. But you actually, you get into it and you realize, like Tom Bombadil, is a long section that was only a little subplot <laughs> that only brings you back to the yeah. main plot to pick it up again. And then he has a similarity, yeah, which is so, like this Genesis story. Yeah, so maybe in this, I don't tend to read this literature like like epic <laughs> fantasy literature, hmm. but epic narrative that's mm. weaving a cast of hundreds and thousands mm. over long periods of time. And there's epic stories and very intimate personal stories and poetry woven in. Mm. That's I wonder the, if there's something similar with like, like if you chronicle together all of like mm. Greek mythology or something mm-hmm. in a canon. Yeah. And you get then all these stories that are probably working together in some way. Yeah. You know, people have compared, yeah, the biblical canon to like the, the canon of Homer's works, you know, like the Odyssey or the yeah. Iliad, um, which again, also refer feature characters that we know were Greek kings and generals and so on, but they've been put into a, this kind of fantasy world of Greek mythology. They're interacting with the gods and so on. But the, and all of, in the, Canon of Homer, there's much debate about the origins of these different materials, you know. Yeah. There's whole scholarly fields that people's whole careers are just about, just like a bib- in biblical studies. Right. People. So there are ancient parallels to at least, the you know, the kind of book that mm-hmm. the Bible is. Because you would never do that. Today, you, well, I guess Tolkien tried it. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, that's yeah. just super rare. Yes. Um, To sit down and try to... Yeah, I mean, and and the thing is, is like it wasn't one author; it was um, yeah many people working together. That's right. Over. It's a collection of collections. So even the people who are bringing the final shape of the Hebrew Bible together, the whole Old Testament or Tanakh. So you have prophets and scholars, you know, working in the Second Temple period, like Ezra and Nehemiah, who feature within the Old Testament themselves. But yeah. we're told that Ezra was a scholar of the Torah of Moses, and so. Um, yeah, we uh, these are authors whose authorship is actually to curate much older works mm. and to bring, work them together and weave them together into much longer epic literary works. Mm. And that's a different way of authoring. Yeah, you know, Tolkien just sat down and over it's kind time, of what a biographer kind of does sometimes. Oh uh, yeah, oh yeah, you just tons of research. 
right? Yeah, and then you pull together all of this work, especially if you're doing a biography of someone who wrote mm-hmm. a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah, a biography is a good example where you have a bunch of historical sources. You do interviews. Yeah. You have pre-existing biographies of the topic, right. person or whatever, and then you work all that together and do a new okay, right. overall cohesive narrative yeah. about General MacArthur or right. something like that. Yeah. And there's previous histories written, so yeah. you incorporate their work, and yeah. you quote them and so on. Yeah. And, but you've also done fresh research, and you do your own reflection, and you tie it all together. Yeah. And that's what was happening during Second Temple Judaism. Correct. Yes. Yeah. The Bible's taking, taking shape. Each of the books of the Old Testament, in, in different ways, the different stories to be told about its own formation history. Many of them had independent authors and origins. But at some point, these different books... Uh, were recognized as having a divine, sacred quality to them. Mm -hmm. That when uh, Israelites were gathered, you know, in worship, that they, something happened. Mm. That they experienced the divine word through these texts. And so these are the texts that kind of rose to the surface. And a very similar story is to be told about the origins of the New Testament, Mm. about that the four gospels, the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter, as early Christians gathered on Sundays... And they read the writings of the apostles aloud. Certain ones went viral (laughs) and uh, became more popular. And other ones that were were valuable and were even really amazing, but didn't um, rise to the top. So one of the earliest uh, post-New Testament documents that we know of is called the First Letter of Clement, who was a church leader in Rome. And uh, it's an amazing document. Mm. It's unbelievable. And it reads like one of Paul's letters. Mm. Um, But Clement wasn't a part of that original first kind of layer of circle of the apostles and disciples around Jesus. Was was he like a second layer? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. uh, Yeah, that's right. And so uh, his letter, while preserved among many circles, Mm. um, didn't rise to the top (laughs) virally, so to speak, and it wasn't linked to the apostles. And so um, it wasn't uh, included within the collection of the New Testament. So there is something about these books that there is... Uh, an existential element to how they became scripture. Um, Once they were written and read as a part of these Jewish and later Christian communities, they were recognized as a a part of this grand epic narrative that the books of the Bible wove wove together. Yeah, so it's interesting that we're jumping around from just what is the Bible back to how the Bible was formed. And this this video in this series (laughs) will not try to discuss how the Bible was formed. But we do want, we do, we are hatching a plan. Yeah. Yeah. We're hatching a plan. We're hatching a plan to... To do that. To do something bigger in the Bible project about like a documentary about the origins of the Bible. But for the sake of this video then, um, it's more about that the Bible is a book Mm -hmm. that is really a library of books that Mm -hmm. all work together and they all work together by contributing Mm -hmm. to an epic narrative. It's an epic, unified story. And this unified story, um, it simplified is the Mm -hmm. story of Abraham. And, well, I'm jumping uh, through a bunch (laughs) of stuff. But um, the story of God in the world... And specifically, and and the, and uh, we we were working on the heaven and earth workbook. You can talk about the story in terms of the union of heaven and earth. Yeah, and that separation. Yeah, yeah. You can talk about it in a couple of ways. You can talk about it just in historical terms. If we're trying to reconstruct the history of the Bible and the people group that it came from, then you're talking about the story of Israel. But if you're trying to understand the story of the biblical texts. And the message that they mm. have, they, they're they telling a story that has the people of Israel at its center, mm-hmm. but it actually has the story of the whole world and all humanity In my, as its main yeah. focus. So for the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, it's, uh, it begins with a set of stories saying the world was designed for so much more mm-hmm. than what we currently experience. Mm. What we currently experience is a world that's been vandalized by stupid humans. Uh, rebellious humans who lost a great opportunity through choosing selfishness and sin, which the story defines as humans trying to define right and wrong on their own wisdom apart from God's wisdom. And so the world's in a bad state and human history has gone off the tracks. What is God going to do about it? He starts a conversation with a guy named Abraham. Mm -hmm. 
And thus begins, that's on page 12 of the Bible, <laughs> <laughs> chapter 12, and thus the rest of the Old Testament becomes the story of the family of Abraham, mm -hmm. but all within that larger story of what is God going to do to rescue the world from itself. But to be fair, the, the rest of the story is about the family of Abraham, and the, and the story is produced mm -hmm. by that the family. family of Abraham. Yep. And as a way for them to understand their identity. Yeah, their role in the world, their history, and their God. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't like some other, like, bibliographer coming back and saying, like, yes. let me tell the story of this yeah. Abraham's family. Yeah. It was actually produced over time yep. within their... That's right. And by significant history. individuals within their history, namely these figures called the prophets. So individuals who had a very unique, <laughs> very unique live connection to the, their God of yeah. Israel. And when they looked out at human history, when they looked at their own people's history, they saw history in a way that other people didn't. Yeah. And they saw God's hand at work weaving Israel's history as a part of the bigger picture to rescue the whole world. And so they... Um, the claim of these documents is that this history of Israel um, is a theological history that comes from these figures called the prophets, mm. Israelite prophets. Mm. Moses, starting with M Moses, and then the chain goes on down through all the famous ones. Mm. Elijah, Nathan, <laughs> Gad, Gad. <laughs> Huldah, all these prophets and prophetesses. Um, so the story of Israel essentially is how is God going to save the world through this family. That's the storyline of the Old Testament. And it gets complicated. They go into slavery, so God rescues them. They want, they, God makes a covenant with them. They go into the promised land. They get kings who are mm -hmm. mostly bad. But there's one good king, and one good king is really important, David, because God says it's actually through a king from the line of David that his rescue for the whole world is going to come. Would be a good analogy is um, our friend Scott Erickson. I don't know how well you know Scott Erickson. Mm, acquaintance. Yeah. Yeah. Scott the painter. Yeah. He did this show. It's kind of one man show where he's telling a story, a uh, personal story. But while he's doing it, um, he's at times painting and um, and talking to you. At times he's playing video mm. um, that is doing something. Mm -hmm. At times he's reading a poem. Mm. Um, at and then times he's going back to a story. Mm -hmm. So it's this eclectic like group of types of communication that he all yes. uses together. Yeah, and by yeah. the end, you don't feel like you just watch some random, mm. uh, you know, mm. You didn't display. watch a movie. You didn't watch a movie. Yeah. You didn't watch uh, a guy paint. You didn't yeah. watch mm. a guy read poetry or do stand-up comedy. But he did tell jokes. Mm -hmm. So it's just this, this mashup mm -hmm. of all these different things. Different media. Different types of media. Different types of media. Yeah. But also you don't go away and go, man, that was just a random smattering of things. Yeah. Was, you go away going, yeah. wow, that all worked together yeah. to communicate something really significant. Yeah. Um, not only was it significant in meaning, huh. but it was a, it was a unified huh. story. Uh -huh. Like he was telling a story from beginning to end about yes. belonging. Huh. And, um, huh. and I think that's maybe a good analogy for what the Bible's doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is a, a good analogy. I mean, I, just to uh, maybe put some people at ease or whatever, I think John and I both hold a historic Orthodox view about the inspiration of the Bible as a divine and human word. Um, but I think what for us, the concern and what's driving this is, for many people, that belief somehow has fostered this other belief that the actual history of the Bible it's, it's complex manuscript history and the very complex history of authorship and so on, that somehow that, that becomes a threat or a scandal to certain mm -hmm. people's view of the Bible as a divine word. Mm -hmm. And then people have to manufacture all of this energy in books and apologetic literature to defend a view of the Bible as if it fell out of heaven and is, hasn't been touched by history. Mm. And um, 
boy, I just think we're really setting up people for a fall uh, when we raise children <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, form people in church communities with that view of the Bible. And so um, what, what we're trying to do, yeah, is orient people to what it is, which is this epic narrative that speaks through so many different kinds of media. Yeah. I really like that analogy. And I but, think that you'd a, have to take it further and say it wasn't a one man show. It oh, was, that's right. Sorry. This is, this is why I got on that tangent is because in a way that is my theological view of the Bible is that it was the, the spirit of God. Yeah. The spirit of God is the one man show. Working came. through many, many different people in a long process <laughs> mm-hmm. to uh, bring these books into existence and as a unified collection. And so that would be the role of Scott <laughs> right? in, in the... Uh, so, so, yeah, to flesh the analogy out, it would be Scott working with or, o- other. or overseeing yeah. a, a bunch of individual artists who yeah. work through their different media. Yeah, but, that uh, would be a... but over time, <laughs> and, over, and those people don't and over... necessarily meet each other. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, But yeah. they know of each other's Cause, work. Because Scott would have to live for over a millennium. Yeah, so. and, this, and Scott would do it over a millennium. <laughs> Scott would start in 2016. <laughs> that's right. And then somehow survive for yeah. many years and, and then finish this project in... About 3,100. <laughs> 3,100. <laughs> AD. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then have all of these different types of media together. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. That's a good analogy. That's a good analogy. And what other book do you read on an average day that's like that? Yeah. I mean, that's just it's a very unique kind of book. The Bible as an art project, a <laughs> metaphor that we're yeah coming with here. And I, this is where I truly, even though I'm a pastor and a Bible nerd, I love to read the Bible. I read it in my spare time as much as possible, and all about it. But I don't for a second think that that's where everybody's at. Um, I, it's hard to read. Yeah. It, it, oh, it's an ancient art project. Because it's an ancient, yeah. <laughs> Divine, divinely inspired. It's, it's a, yeah, totally. And it's rooted in his history and historical events, and there's an enormous amount of debate about how that works out. But it is rooted. Yeah. When I say art project, I don't want someone, all of a sudden I realize someone's going to go like, oh, what a, <laughs> a hippie, new age. Nonsense. Dude, well, okay, but no, let's pause here. So one of, for me, one of the most, oh, one of the most exciting, igniting things to my imagination I had been a Christian for about a year, and I was sitting and I signed up for classes at a local Christian university, and I'm and I'm taking my first Bible classes from a teacher, a professor named Ray Lubeck, and his whole deal is Christians need to learn how to read the Old Testament like Jewish people read it, mm. and as a work of high literary and theological art. Mm. And the, the the books of all the books of the Hebrew Bible and New Testament are, as I've called it, the work of literary... Well, not this is my friend, Andy, who calls it this, the work of literary ninjas. <laughs> um, and so, it, truly, the, the, the literary... Why does he like the word ninja? Well, I think you're just thinking of somebody who's extremely nimble and sophisticated. Yeah. Nothing's unintentional. Right. Every no move, movement yeah. is calculated. Yeah. And, the and then you're like, yes. how did you break that guy's neck? Yeah, totally. <laughs> All of a sudden... <laughs> <laughs> you barely moved. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Hebrew Bible is an extremely sophisticated piece of ancient literary art. I think that's that, one thing. That is making, a, that has a theological message, but it's doing it through this incredibly nuanced literary medium. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, that just exploded my brain. Mm. And and then I've sent me on, a, whatever, I'm, when was that? That was... Jeez, that was almost 20 years ago. And I still feel like I'm scratching the surface. Of oh, my, that was like 90... It was 96 I signed 96? up for, for classes. Oh, wow. I was almost 20. And uh, no, I was 20. And yeah, I'm still so boggled by the sophistication of the literary art of the Bible that I... I there's so much... It's literary genius. It's literary saying. genius. I mean, we're talking Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and, you know, Steinbeck type of mm-hmm. level here but it's from an ancient culture mm-hmm. which is what makes it hard i think those two things together make it hard for us to engage yeah in. it's hard it's hard to appreciate literary genius yeah. even when it's in your own culture yeah because totally. yeah. yeah. it's a lot to chew yep off yep chew off chew on chew on bite off bite off yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah but this is an ancient mm-hmm. from an ancient culture that thinks in different ways that i written think, in a different language written in a different language yeah. and so yeah double whammy yeah and and it's our conviction that that's the vehicle 
that God has chosen to speak to his people throughout history. <laughs> and uh, you just got to stick that in your pipe and smoke it, so to speak. You just got to uh, chew on that one. But that is, that's certainly how Jesus viewed the scriptures. Okay, so we're talking about how sophisticated the Bible is. It's literary genius. It's also an ancient document. This can get really intimidating for people. Um, you know, it's kind of like saying, in order to be a Christian, you have to be a uh, a food connoisseur or a movie critic. Um, it's, it's a high bar. Well, okay, yeah. Uh, yes, I hear that. But, um but once again, we're back to, but the Bible didn't fall out of heaven and then say, you all have to become movie critics to understand who God is. The Bible emerged from a living historical people group mm -hmm. that was a worshiping community, people mm -hmm. of Israel and then the early Christians. So the history of the Bible is very much the history of God's people. And people didn't encounter the Bible in a vacuum. They encountered it as a part of a vibrant, thriving religious community. Mm -hmm where you're learning about God, not only through these texts, but through your parents and your friends and your family. So I just want to, I want to not make the sophistication of the Bible some kind of barrier to just be like, you have to sure. know everything to just be a Christian. No, you just, you have to know about the story about Jesus and want to love God and love your neighbor. But maturing and growing as a follower of Jesus yeah. means to learn about the Bible yeah. and how to read it better, at least. Right. Yeah. Well, it can feel daunting to to say that you need you you would benefit from by appreciating literary art. Mm. Um, that can I can feel very daunting to yeah. people. Yeah. But I think also that that the way literature works is kind of hardwired in our brain. Yeah. Especially narrative. Yeah. Especially narrative. Like I mean, it's just how we think. Yeah. It's just really, really well crafted. Yeah. Narratives and stories. And the way we tell each other stories and the way we communicate mm -hmm. like this yeah. uh yeah you know the a good turn of phrase is in a way poetry mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um while we don't all go away and write and read poetry and really soak it up we all can appreciate how language can yeah be poetic and then all of a sudden have so much more meaning <clears throat> and importance in in day to day life so i mean i feel like yeah it's it's basic to being human yeah. is appreciating yeah language that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, it's it's a, a very intentional, beautiful form of communication, storytelling, poetry. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Bible is that. And so really what, it's just, in, yeah, it's just interesting mm. that that it, since that the Bible is at the center of Christian experience, mm. then being a person who appreciates literature should be at the center of the Christian experience. Maybe uh, not the center. Jesus should be in the center. Yeah, no, I was actually about to say, I think Jesus is the center, Jesus is the center. of Christian existence. And then the Bible is, a, is an indispensable way that we encounter Jesus through yeah. the, the Spirit speaking through the Scriptures yeah. to his people. So, it's, but, so the Bible has a very close relationship to Jesus. Jesus is the center, and the Bible is the way that we experience, encounter, encounter that center. One of the primary ways. I think there are or other ways, but Protestants have been debating about that for <laughs> centuries. I get really excited when we talk about being people of the book and mm. being how important this book is and how, um, mm. you know, it could turn people off and be like, oh man, I got to be an English major now <laughs> yeah, right. in order to be a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. even an English major, like a Hebrew <laughs> <laughs> scholar. but right. uh, Which is obviously not true. Which is not true. No. Um, but it does mean growing in my ability and appreciation of literature. Yeah, and at least I, of biblical literature. But that excites me, and not mm. because I, I'm not a literature guy. Like I have, I've, I haven't read Shakespeare except for like the one or two things I've had to read. Yeah, I like. I don't. I'm not like a literary literary geek. Yeah. Um, but it excites me to think about. Yeah. Have it like that's 
that will help me understand mm. my faith more. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a way to make that inspirational. Mm. You know, okay, here's maybe an angle. I forget what essay this was in by C.S. Lewis, but I remember reading it early on. He t- was talking about the importance of literature in um, a classic, classical education. Mm. Um, it's a, yeah, something about through literature, I l- can live life through the eyes of others. Mm-hmm. And I can see the world through the eyes of other people's stories and cultures. Um, that is one of the great values of literature is uh, it's someone's experience, another people groups or another person's experience, a story or poem that invites me into their way of seeing the world. Yeah. And that's precisely what the Bible's doing. Right. It's trying to invite us into an alternate view of the world and an alternate view of who we are and of human history and of what's most important. And it does it through this well-crafted hmm. piece of literature. Yeah. That's the, what literature does to you. Yeah. And um, so in that sense, I agree with you. It is, it is exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, that I think it's, would... it's exciting in the same way that like, and maybe this is just Portland culture, but it's like, <laughs> it's like, oh man, I'm really, I'm really into beer now. Yeah. So what are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to like get the homebrew kit. Yeah. You're going to learn about all the ingredients. You're going to mess around mm. and you're going to just geek out and mm-hmm. you're going to go on brewery tours and you're going to like, yes. I mean, you're just going to dive in deep. Yeah. And you're going to geek out. And that's, and that's even quite broad. I mean, Portland is host to yeah. so many niche subcultures. Right. You're like, going to get really good at a at, specific yeah. IPA or something. Oh, no. I'm talking about like salt. Have you been to the, the salt store? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Where they have hundreds of different kinds of no, salt. No, I haven't been to the salt from store. all over the planet. Really? Different tastes, different yeah. purposes. And you buy these tiny little oh, pouches of salt for, oh, for a lot of money <laughs> yeah. to put in certain recipes. Right. And, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Right. That's just, totally. Exactly. Yeah. Like I'm gonna if I'm gonna season my food, I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna go to, yeah. I'm going all in. <laughs> yeah. I've been joking about how we need like a a, a a tots, like a handcrafted artisanal tot tots <laughs> tot stand. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah. So like, but there's so there's something there's something exciting mm. about saying like, mm. Mm. Um, not only am I gonna care about this, but I think. If I mm. dive in as deep as possible, mm. this thing will create a lot of meaning for my life. Mm. And there's a spirit of that in Portland. And mm. yeah, you're not, I mean, mm. that's fun to learn about salts and like get really good at knowing about your salts. Yeah. But is that going to bring you like true meaning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it'll, it's a good hobby, what, yeah. you know, possibly. But, um, but there's something about diving in a, a, about mm. this book mm. and uh, appreciating the, the artistry of the book mm-hmm. and, and geeking out about it, mm-hmm. that you don't have to do that to be a Christian. Like, you don't have to go yeah. all in. Right, um, yeah. but but you But it's so much more connected mm. to finding meaning mm. because that's all it's interested in. Yeah, it is, yeah that's right. It, about the meaning. Human flourishing and yeah, the uh, being meaning connected of human existence. To, the, to God and the divine yes. and yeah. everything. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. Okay, so what, yeah, what we're saying is we both feel that personally. Mm-hmm. That's already infused a lot of what we're doing in the Bible Project. And so that... Pro- and at different needs- levels, like you've devoted your life for the last 20 years geeking out at like level n- 10. Sure, and, yeah, sure. Um, and I... Uh, and I've brought and now I've br- and now brought I, you into my yeah. happy little world. And I'm in here crawling around, like scratching <laughs> out uh, things yeah. in that world. Um, and then there'll be other people who might yeah. listen to a podcast, or they might go to a class, or my different things. Mm. There's all different kinds of levels, but like, um, mm-hmm. uh, cause I'm not. I don't think I'm ever gonna. I'm not gonna learn Hebrew. No, I think it's too late in my life to try to yeah I don't, yeah I don't I don't recommend it and at the same time I don't not everybody is gonna read the hundred great modern classics or something <laughs> like that you know it's just it's not realistic for most people but there are some but cla- that doesn't mean you shouldn't pick up a classic and that's right it. yeah Steinbeck's East of Eden arguably one of the most important important literary works of the last hundred years um and it'll just blow you. and by the way, it's all about Genesis chapter four. The mm. whole story is spun out of Genesis mm. chapter four. Yeah. Um, so that's a great example of the legacy of the literary art of the Bible living on mm-hmm. in one of the great Western literary classics. Yeah. So 
Yeah. So, so, how so maybe we... there could be something like that. I don't know if it's that like mm. Portland hipster sounding, but like, <laughs> but about like what what is the yeah. Bible slash like should I care? Mm. Um, and should I? Um, mm. Or I don't know. No. Yeah. I think maybe it doesn't fit. Well, what is? Yeah. I no. I agree. I think because arguably you could say, I yeah, agree. I'm going to be a Christian, but the Bible. I don't really mm. need it. Yeah. Like I'm not yeah. I'm not gonna read it. Yeah. Uh, I might pretend I do just to get some people off my back. Um, but mm. but my Christian experience is connected to yeah. pr- praying and Yeah, praying um, or my participation in ch- in a church community. Yeah, the sacraments at the church, yep. um, the relationships I have yeah. there. And I have an appreciation for scripture. Yeah. You know, and yeah. every once in a while, like I might enjoy it yeah. being read at a wedding or yeah. you know, at mass or service or whatever. But um but I'm not going to really geek out about this book. Mm. And I'm okay with that. Um and I'm I'm also really highly suspicious of other people who do. Because <laughs> it's usually like <laughs> Yeah. Um it's usually for yeah, yeah. lame purposes. Yeah, yeah, you feel Oftentimes. like you're, you're being sold something. Yeah. Um so I don't know. I just I I'd, mm. I'd, I'd be interested if we couldn't mm. get the that that person mm. to go um mm. man maybe mm. maybe i should like yeah instead of i was gonna geek out about fly fishing in this next <laughs> season of my life <laughs> yeah but maybe like i'll yeah. put some of that geekery towards the bible yes yeah it's a way of saying in the same way that um many people turn to reading literature to enrich their life yeah it's the same thing. It's right. saying this is a remarkable piece of literature. Uh, I, I think it does more above and beyond your normal piece of literature, but it's not less than a piece of amazing literature. It could feel that way at times because it's um, it's written in a different language. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that you'll, you'll read parts of the Bible and it'll yeah. be like, oh, yeah. this is but, boring. But, but it's all about your expectations that you come with. Um, most people, if they've been introduced to the Bible... It's been through their childhood, and it's and it's through being presented versions of the biblical stories that are nowhere near as brilliant as the actual story. <laughs> yeah, and that's dumbed pro- down. That's the problem of yeah of um, uh, whatever. Yeah, that's true. I mean, dumbed down for uh, and whitewashed, like with the scandalous parts all removed. Yeah, you know, for kids, they're for, turned into children's literature. For kids, and the Bible is not or, children's, but literature. also for adults, just to keep it simple. <laughs> that's right. Like, yeah. remove some of the complexity. That's right. And so then once somebody knows the story, then they come to the actual biblical account and they assume they already know what to expect from it. Um, but if my expectation coming is to a narrative in the Bible that, man, there's so much more going on here than I realize. Like there's a brilliant mind under here. Yeah. And I'm going to read and reread and think and ponder because somebody amazing and brilliant is trying to talk to me here. And hmm. that will make for a completely different kind of experience in mm. reading the story about David, for example. Can we talk about kids for a second? Because mm. we both have young kids. Yes. And um, there's, I think in evangelical Christian culture, there's this assumption that when your kids are really young, like one of the most important things you can do mm. is educate them with Bible stories. Yeah, I know. That's really, really important. Yes. Um, because that's when their minds are most malleable. Mm-hmm. And so if they're going to to not only learn something well, um, I mean, like when you're going to learn a language, you're going to learn most things, like your brain is developing. Yeah. Yes. So there's that argument. But then also it's just, it's easier to convince some someone mm-hmm. of the value of something mm-hmm. when, when, when they've that got young. that in their background. Yeah. Um, no, when they're that young. Oh, oh. I yeah, see. like you can just like we could tell our kids like this is important, and yes. then they'll be like, oh yeah, sure, of course, that's important because you're my dad. And, yeah. Um. So, but the problem, but we've identified this other problem, mm. which is mm-hmm. if you try to take the Bible and turn it into kids' material, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you generally have to um, mm. shave off the edges a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and dumb it down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because because one part of it's not appropriate for kids. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. but two, it's it's too sophisticated. Yeah, for kids to That's understand right. in many levels. Yeah. Um, and so uh, so I don't know. There's this 
there's this tension here then of, because if you do that, then you're going to have a kid grow up and go, yeah, the Bible, that's that really childish, mm. um, mm-hmm. kind of boring. Yeah, I already uh, get it. Piece of literature that yeah. I've been told before and it's boring. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Um, yeah. And it's because you probably were given a, a much more digestible version. Yeah. Which, uh, than which, the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then the other route is you just say, hey, son, this is too sophisticated for you. <laughs> like, come back to me when you're older, and then we'll open up scriptures. And mm-hmm. then, you know, mm-hmm. well, you missed out a great opportunity mm. to to help your kids experience mm-hmm. God's Word in a time where their brains are developing in very important ways. Mm-hmm. This obviously, a lot of people are going to have very differing and deep convictions yeah. about how to go with that. So I don't claim. And I'm a young dad. Like yeah. My kids are little, so we're... Um, at at this point, what I'm trying to do is get the story of the stories about Jesus in front of my kids as much as possible. Mm. If anything, I mean, I I know the Noah and the Ark and Moses and so on, and the, so it's very it's important. I agree, but what actually I care about more is the the stories about Jesus' character and his teachings and how he treated people. That that's like the bedrock of mm. their childhood Bible imagination. And then from there, I personally, I'm just floating real high over the biblical story with my kids. And uh, it's great to have the Bible Project videos <laughs> to, to, to do that. And uh, But I feel like I'm just now starting to engage my five-year-old on some the bigger storyline of the Bible. My biggest fear is that there's going to be all this stuff that I kind of help, help him fix in his mind. And then I'm later going to have to do some unlearning to help him learn the next layer of whatever, mm. you know. I think that, to me, that's the challenge is um, encountering the flood story mm. is just not helpful if all you get is that story by itself. Because mm-hmm. then, usually it's a whitewash story that's just like, Noah obeyed God and built a boat. Mm-hmm. So you go build a boat too? I don't know, you know? Uh, but when it fits oh, into the uh, epic... Obey God. When it fit, obey God, yeah. And so, okay, that's fine. You know, I actually do think that's a motif of the story, that Moses was righteous and walked with God. But how that story fits in to the stories before it and after it and leads up to Genesis chapter 12 and Abraham, like that's all crucial, crucial for how that story is told. And that's, I don't know, hmm. it's challenging. So right now I'm sticking with Jesus and the overall biblical story of like God loves the world, the world screwed up, but God wants to rescue it. And Jesus was key to that. That's it for this episode. We're going to continue this conversation and walk through the structure of the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and look at every single book and how it contributes to the story. It's going to be a really great, informative discussion. It gives you a bird's eye view of the composition of this book. In the meantime, say hi to us. We're on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Bible Project. And our videos are free, and they're on YouTube, youtube.com slash The Bible Project. We're also making print resources, and all of that you could find on our website, thebibleproject.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, you can give a review on iTunes. That helps a lot in our exposure, and you can share it with your friends. Thanks for being a part of this with us.